Okay, uh, hello everyone. Um, welcome to tutorial three. Uh, just want to give maybe one or two minutes to see if we have any more uh, newcomers. So um, yeah, let's start in a couple of minutes. I'll just get everything ready uh, in the meantime. By the way, I have um, the, the codes that we're gonna use today. I have pasted on code share. So I'm putting the link up there in the chat. So you guys can also have access to it. While we uh, wait, please take a, a second to download the, the data, um, the data uh, file from, from uh, Blackboard. It's called Mertz. And, and, you know, as always, make sure that you have it in a folder and you set your folder as working directory, right? So all of these things, um, we should be, you should, you should build a bond of what we learned before. So I'm not uh, going to show or, you know, take time to do this. So I will uh, ask you guys to please go and download the files, make everything like uh, ready on your on your sessions uh, and we will start um, from there okay let's just give I think we still have uh, guys coming I'm not sure let's let's just give another minute and we'll start. Okay, let's let's get started. So for today's tutorial, we're going to learn or build on what we learned last week. Uh, last week we were discussing um, like how ARMA models are um, built, uh, what are the components, and we kind of went through a little bit of uh, a, a model selection. Uh, today we're going to do uh, the model selection formally, like with a, with a proper procedure. And um, the procedure that we're going to do today is going to be pretty much consistent throughout the semester, uh, regardless of what models are we working with. Um, it will be, I mean, if not the same, it will be very similar. Okay. Um, so we're going to load uh, data from the stock prices of Merck and company. We have observations from 2001 to 2013. That's daily data. So we have heaps of data. Um, and we will denote that adjusted close price as Y for simplicity in our codes. Um, yeah, and we're going to subset the data. I will show you how, how this will be done. But um, actually, before we move any further, I wanted to remind you that the online quiz one is up there. It's already there. It will be closed next Monday, March 21st. So please uh, don't forget to stop there, uh, you know, review the materials, uh, stop in, in, on Blackboard and, and do this. You don't want to miss uh, the few marks that this will uh, this will add to your final grade, right? So uh, I will hold consult right after this dispute in case you want to like check something before the quiz. Um, so yeah, more than welcome to stay around and, and, and shoot some questions. Uh, okay, so the data that we're going to work, uh, like we're going to do a little bit of managing for the data because we're not gonna use the whole uh, chunk of data. We're going to do a forecast, right? So every time you want to test a forecast uh, tool or technique, what you do is that you set up uh, some observations or like a large amount of observations into a group. Uh, that, that's the group that you use to model and select your model. And yeah. And then you 
a safe uh, bit of uh, observations by the end of the of the yeah of the sample in order to like predict those extra points and compare to the real data right so we have observations that start from January 20 uh, 2001 to December 2013. So uh, we were asked to keep only observations uh, from January 2011 until the, the end of January 2012. Okay. So everything before and everything after this interval will be dropped. Uh, I will show you how to subset this, but first it's it, it, it's good to like know how this is done. Actually, uh, just give me a sec. For those of you that just arrived, uh, I will I will paste the code share link again in the in the chat, so you guys can have access to the to the codes uh, for today's session. Okay, so we're going to keep these observations right. We will trim our data set, and these observations that we're keeping, we're going to split in those two groups that I was mentioning. Uh, all the observations from year 2011 will be uh, selected into the data that we're going to use for model selection. Uh, that's what we call, or what it's called in data science as a training set. Using that training set, we come up with a model, we do some predictions uh, for January 2012, and we test those predictions against the real observations, which correspond to January 2012, right? So again, in a data science uh, uh, um, context, that's called a test set. So how do we do this? The first thing is to assign dummy variables or logical operators to, to these observations. So we're going to create a variable. It's not gonna be the same name, but something like that, that will take a value of one for observations in 2011, and then value of zero for observations in 2012. Actually, the, the way that R works is, um, oops, sorry. The way that R works is to, it will, add a logical uh, operator to this. So it will, instead of one will be true, uh, true, 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 all of these will be true, but they will work in a similar fashion. And when it's not, the condition is not met, it will be, it will have false, 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 and so on, right? All of this will be true. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, we will do the same uh, for the test set. But of course, this will be inverted. All of these will be false, and all of these will be true. Uh, that way, we can subset our data to only use the information that we want, that, that we require. OK, so let me jump to R now to show how this will be done. So first thing, uh, it's always recommended, not a necessary thing to do, but it's always good to have your environment empty and ready for work. You can always use this broom stick as well. Do the same thing. Uh, sometimes even if it's empty, uh, some like loops or stuff that we come across can create hidden objects. So it's better just to delete those hidden objects and not uh, worry about that, okay? Uh, please let me know if you don't have access to code share. The, all these codes should be there. So what I'm going to do is explain how uh, like the code kind of works. Uh, like what are the arguments and conditions of the code? Uh, but I'm not going to be typing, right? I figure it's um, it's more productive if we just keep this uh, doing this. Uh, so please co copy all of that from the code share in a fresh R script. And, uh, you know, if you copy and paste from line one, the lines will be consistent with mine. So it'll be easier for you, like, you know, to see, hey, uh, line 19, I have a problem, whatever, you can compare, like, straightforward. And uh, as the previous week, I don't know if you noticed, but for the previous weeks, like tutorial one and two, I, um, like, had uh, my R script loaded into Blackboard. So this file will also be up there for you. So before we start, for today, we're going to use a package called forecast. Uh, so forecast uh, will be uh, 
they contain some functions that are pertain to um, time series uh, work and that is super useful. So I would recommend like first check in your package uh, log here if you don't have a package called forecast. Um, so they are in alphabetical order. So you can just go to the apps. I don't have it. So what you do is you use install.packages and use uh, like the name of the package in between quote marks and you run it and it's going to take a second it has a one of my packages uh currently loaded da, 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 da. yeah let's restart r it's going to take um a minute it will um, load forecast and a bunch of other packages so let's just give r a couple of seconds to fix this you can do like you do that uh, as well on your on your own sessions, please, to make sure that uh, you can follow my work. That's gonna take two or three minute stops. All right, let me see. Oh, I did not. I did not install updating lo loaded packages. It seems that it, um, okay. okay. Oh, also this warning, don't, don't worry about warning messages per se. Sometimes they're just telling stuff like if you want to, I don't know, update the data. This is for developers, right? Uh, so what version of our tools was it built on, but don't worry about it. It has added a lot of, no, not a lot, a lot some a few packages, in particular color space as well. We will also need that. So make sure that you have color space already installed. It should be installed after you install forecast. If it's not, you can use the same here, but instead of forecast here, you put color space, no capital letters all uh, together. And let me see. S um, forecast EF here, okay? Make sure that you have those here. And with library forecast, we will um, activate the package. You can use the library command or you can use, um, like you can tick here. It's taking a, a, a minute there but you can tick it in here and you will do the same. You will notice that it will load the library uh, command here as well. Register S3, da, 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 written warning messages was built on the version 4.1.3. Again, warning messages, most of the times are just FYI, so don't worry about it. It's different than error messages. I noticed that the like red uh, writing can be a little bit like alarming, but don't worry about it. So yeah, and you notice like it's ticked here, so it's all ready to go. So let's subset the data uh, first on the training set. So all the observations from the beginning on the beginning of 2011 until um, the end of 2012. So December, um, wait, hang on, uh, January it says here. We're keeping everything. So we're subsetting, we're keeping like the whole, um, wait, I think it's easier if I show you from here. We're just keeping all of this, right? We're not selecting between training set and test set yet. We're just uh, like dropping everything else other than the, uh, the data that we're gonna work today. So let's load the data. This file merc.csb capital M should be in your working directory. Uh, same command that we have used, read.delim. And this is the name that I give to the data set. Uh, this name can be whatever, like we mentioned before, it can be my underscore data, it can be, I don't know, data, whatever. As long as it is consistent, you will not have a problem. So I have loaded, we have 3,268 observations of seven variables. So this is what I was mentioning before. We have uh, uh, data from Yahoo Finance regarding opening price, high price, lower price, and all of that. 
and volume of transactions for this stock. Uh, we're keeping adjusted price uh, as our variable of interest. Uh, it's good to use that because uh, it will take this close price and it will do some adjustments to it to control for some phenomena. So it's better to work with this. So we don't worry about open, high, light, low, close, and volume. That those variables are not important. And you notice here the dates. So we're going to take observations that are like, uh, not yet, the, yeah, like something here, like all year 2011 and only January 2012. So to do that, we will uh, create that true and false uh, a vector that I mentioned before. But instead of like for the training and test set, we will do it for like everything, right? So we will do it for um, all of these will be false. Everything in here will be true, 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 all of these. And everything afterwards will be false. So this is the first sub setting that we're going to do. And we need that object to create that criteria. Um, the observations are in date format, that variable. So it makes it easier for us to use uh, logical operators. So we have observations that are older than uh, the first day of 2011 and uh, observations that are closer or lower than the last day of January of 2012. So we run this line and we have here, this is what I was mentioning. It will show you a lot of false for the first observations and then a bunch of truths and then some falses. And here we can take adjusted close price and add it to our new column, to a new object that we're going to call Y. And we are only keeping the observations of adjust close for the selected sample that we have here. So we take that and we uh, have now these observations. All of these go from uh, January 2011 until the end of January 2012. We have 272 days observed. All right, let me jump to Will. Question. Yeah, go for um, it. For, for this line, why do we need to do it as matrix? Is there any special motive for that? I don't think so. I mean, technically, we can also do it as um, as a data frame, we can uh -huh. also do it as a vector. But uh, I feel like since Eric has worked with um, MATLAB, uh, like it's his software of choice, mm -hmm. and MATLAB, you will definitely have to work with this as matrices. So I think that's him being consistent with uh, the way that he knows to do stuff pretty much. Uh, that makes sense, got it. But Thank we you. can do that in a bar, in a vector, we can, I mean, a, a matrix of one dimension and it's a vector technically, we can also do it as data frame, it will not be a problem. Perfect, Thank you. No worries. Alrighty, uh, for question B, now we were asked to create a couple of variables to generate the first difference of yt, so it's yt minus the previous value of yt, that's another a variable that we're going to generate a lot and uh, one transformation that we're going to do. And I will show you why this is super useful. And we were also going to calculate or generate the log returns, which is log of the values of yt divided by the previous values of yt. So in order to avoid having to generate like the lag value of that, what we're going to do is first use the diff uh, command here. I'm not sure I have, um, I am, uh, no, it's not on the package, sorry. It, it, it will work regardless of you having forecast installed, but it's a very useful op uh, uh, operation here because you will just use diff in whatever variable you're first differencing and it will do it for you. You don't have to program more than that. So if we run line 19, you'll notice here that it's now telling me, okay, from day two, from day one to day two, variable uh, y in, uh, grew by 0 0.2, from day two to day three, it grew by 0 0.16 approximately, and so on for all those days. Naturally, we'll do, we will lose one observation when we do this, right? Because we don't have 
like how it changed from point zero to point one. So that first point will be lost. So don't worry about like inconsistencies here, it makes sense. And we're also calculating the log returns. So I'm adding that also the result as a matrix as well. And what I'm doing is taking the objects from the second uh, row until whatever number of rows, so until the 272nd, calculating the log of that and subtracting the log of um, one uh, of y, but from one step before, right? So starting from the first row until the end, but we will do from one step uh, before. So for the first row, it will go to zero, so we will avoid that. But from the second onwards, it will take the second of y and the first of y. We will do the logs, subtract, find the difference, and that's how we calculate the returns. So let's do this. And you will notice as well that it will have 271 observations there. Uh, we do this. Uh, I think that's one strength that working with Y as a matrix has, because with these indexes here, uh, we can also. But I think we can do that with data frames as well. So I, I'm not too worried about it. Now, if you notice, when you open DY, R, and Y, the names are non-existent and it has variable one, variable one, variable one. So if we were to plot any of these variables, which we're going to do next, the y-axis will not have a nice name. So it's better if we just change the names of these columns uh, to what we know there is. Y corresponds to the like adjusted stock prices of Merck, right? The y's changes in those stock prices in R log returns. So we want to do these three. These three codes are entirely optional, but you notice that when you visualize uh, the, the matrices that we have created, the column names have changed. And like knowing what the stuff is, is also, is always beneficial, I think. All righty, let's see uh, now for part C. I know that I am, uh, like you probably noticed that I'm kind of speeding uh, by this part, this is just preliminary stuff. When we get to uh, parts that I will need to explain more of it, I will uh, stop and do that. Okay, so don't worry about it if you feel like we are not good having any context or anything like that. We're just doing a preliminary stuff and then we will do to the nice, to the, you know, to the fun stuff. Okay, so let's go to part C. Now let's draw time series plots of Y, delta Y, and R. And let's comment on the station. Actually, let's do RT later. Let's just focus on these two for now. And let's just comment on the stationarity of the processes uh, that these uh, observations might have generated. So, you know, let me, okay. Uh, yeah. So um, before we start this, I will introduce the process. So from last week, you guys uh, probably remember that all the work that we did, like analyzing ARMA models, like, you know, autoregressive moving average and ARMA models, we started from a couple of assumptions. We assumed that the time series is stationary, right? And we know, or you guys remember all the uh, conditions that, uh, or all the implications that that condition has. And also we're assuming that the time series is a, it has white noise residuals and the implications of that assumption as well, right? So for all of these models to be, like all these ARMA models to be appropriate, um, we need to uh, test these assumptions, okay? We cannot work with a time series in which we don't have proof of stationarity, or at least, uh, I mean, for now, we're just doing it by eye. Later, we're going to learn how to test for this more formally. Uh, but yeah, we, we, we need to be careful there. So the first thing is an eye test, right? So let's uh, draw a time series plot of Y, and let's see if we can spot any obvious trends or volatility clustering. I will show you what I mean. So remember that I mentioned that we're going to work first, like to model our data, we're going to work with observations that are 
in 2011. So I'm going to do the same that I did before to set, but um, I'm going to do now this bit here, right? I'm going to select stuff that is in 2011 and leave outside the stuff that is in January 2012. And later I will do this last step. So let's jump to R and let's, um, let's create this object that will help us with those logical operations. And in here, I am also going to subset the dates uh, that correspond to like this interval, okay? Uh, I'm keeping that pretty much to serve me as a label for later, right? So I'm keeping these observations, uh, you know, starting from January, 2011, you can see it in here on your right. Uh, on and it will start by it will it will end by the end of January twenty I uh, know by the end of December twenty eleven will be equal to two it, it will be stored here and nothing else. So why did I do this? Because when I'm plotting uh, the variable that goes in the horizontal axis in a time series plot is time, right? So we will keep that information from the dates in the horizontal axis and we'll keep the variable in the vertical axis and we are subsetting them by only the observations that are in 2011. Uh, type here as a line, right? I don't want a scatter plot, I want a line. And I'm adding a couple of labels for X and for Y, but this is entirely optional. And in here, you can probably notice that uh, by changing this column names to Y, I saved myself having to type this again. In any point in the future where I want to plot, why I will save to have like having to type this and everything will be consistent. So let's do it for y first. And we will get this plot like pretty much going from January 2011 until the end of January 2012. So let me go back to the slides for a second. This is the plot. Now, again, I test and, and stationary time series, uh, as we uh, like studied last week. It's a variable that goes like oscillating up and down. Those oscillations are not too wild and we don't have high peaks and low dips. It's usually consistent, not, yeah, not too, not too crazy. And it will like go up and down, like orbiting or oscillating around the same point, a point that is constant across time. In case, in this case of Y, uh, it seems that that's not the case. It seems that the mean is uh, changing over time. So I just drew these lines. And this is not like official by any means. It's just like, how would we chase the mean of this variable over time? And we notice that this uh, mean of this variable clearly uh, is changing over time, right? At some point, it's just going down, then it's going up, then it kind of stays there, goes down, but not too much. Then it goes dramatically down, it goes dramatically up. Okay. So um yeah, this is not a this time series is not appropriate to use to, to model using R. Okay. We will we want we won't want this. Now the the, the thing here, the, the nice thing here is that once we find the difference of that variable, we find that first difference. Uh, it um, makes it like not always, but most of the times it will bring a lot of stationarity to a time series, right? It will uh, kind of take care of these trends um, or these uh, means that change over time, not always, but sometimes, most of the times, I would dare to say. So it's like good practice, like if you don't, if you can't work with Y, Let's just do dy and see what happens, right? Once we do it and we notice, hey, maybe it might be okay, then we move forward and we get this. So the only change that I made to this code is just changing what variable is in the vertical axis. In this case, it's dy that we have generated before. So let me jump now for the first difference. I just left, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, first difference of yt is equal to this. I left the equation there. As a reminder, uh, in this case, this uh, like the dynamic that the like the observations follows, meaning the data generating process, 
seems to have a zero mean, seems to be constant. Like regardless how low it goes, it will come back. How high it goes, it will come back. So it's good. Uh, the variance though, it's not constant. Like at some point in here might be a little bit uh, consistent, but you know, we have these weird variations. So might be that the variance assumption is not met. It's not constant over time. Remember those gammas that we studied last week? Uh, but for now, let's assume, like, like not, not, not assume, let's overlook this fact and let's just keep, keep uh, pressing later, like way later in the semester, we're going to learn how to deal with these volatility clusters. Uh, but it's good to, to, to identify that they are there. I we noticed, right, that we mentioned before that these uh, values that go around the same point and, and that's always good to, to, to see. Variables like this we can use. It's, it will be better if we have a variance that is constant, but uh, let's uh, uh, oversee that, overlook at that fact, and let's uh, use our math to forecast. So the next, uh, the next step is to check at the ACF and PACF plots of YT and delta YT as well. Because uh, like we mentioned yesterday, the um, like an indication of stationarity, not a formal test, uh, can be uh, done by, I, um, by an eye test of two things. The time series plot that we have here and the ACF and PACF of the variable. So let's complement this analysis with the ACFs. So for Y, we'll use ACF, again, subsetting for only observations in 2011. This is the same command that we used last week. We have this ACF and the PACF as well here. So let me jump back to my slideshow to show this. Now, one thing to note is that the, sorry, the um, first point, so row one, remember that's this one. Don't, don't like disregard the first line, please. The first, of, this first realization of the autocorrelation function is a number that is very close to one, right? It, it will be a 0 0.9 something. That's always a sign of alarm. So, and it will decay quite slowly, right? It's decaying towards zero, but it will take a long time. Even by the end of our uh, uh, horizon, it still haven't uh, decayed to zero. So that's that's a bad indicator. And complemented with the fact that the partial autocorrelation function also starts at a point that's quite close to one, and then sharply goes to zero, that's also a bad sign. Uh, but if we were to compare it to the theoretical patterns um, that like the um, ARMA models follow, we'll be tempted to say that this model follows an uh, AR1 uh, uh, model uh, that whose coefficient is very close to one, right? So it'd be something like 0 0.9, uh, let's say six, something like that, and same in here same number here. Um, like, you know, they're too close to one, but that's not good because we will be assuming that A1, it's dangerously close to one. You guys remember that we, that's a huge no-no. The condition is this, that is lower than one, never equal. Um, so that's an indication of the presence of unit rules. So every time we see something like that, like the ACF, starts very close to one, so does the PACF. And ACF decays very slowly, and ACF decays quite sharply. That's an indicator that this time series, uh, it's no good. We should not work with this. Now let's do the same for delta YT to confirm that we can work with delta YT. So we will generate these two plots. You can see them in here, and let's analyze them more detail. Again, in terms of the um, in terms of the ACF plot, please don't worry about this. This is row zero. Row zero should not affect our analysis. We we'll start from row one always. 
And uh, yeah, it does not have, like you can't see any structure on it. It's not, it, it seems to oscillate or something, but it's never significantly different than zero. We just have a point here, but yeah, it's uh, pretty much zero. So um, it's, it's a good and a bad thing. It's a good thing, the fact that we don't observe a, 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 a behavior that will be a cause for alerts. But it also is not giving us any implication or any indication, better word, an indication of which uh, model will be more appropriate, right? So it's a, it's a bit of a um, bittersweet uh, sentiment here. Uh, ACF also seems to oscillate, like you notice how it goes positive, negative, positive, negative, and so on, but it's never uh, significant. So again, no structure. No negative behavior, but not indicator of what kind of model to use. Like if we were to compare with any uh, theoretical patterns, we won't find any. Uh, so it's not uh, like it's not making our lives easier. But uh, we find that this this uh, process delta y t is more appropriate to work with an ARMA model. Okay, so let's do that in order to uh, forecast this variable. The next step that we do is checking information criteria. So I will introduce what information criteria is, and then we'll go to R to do it. And the thing is that the procedure is you build a huge, uh, no, not a huge, but a large set of models, set of combinations of, uh, uh, of, oops, B and Q components. So we build a set of uh, P and Q components, uh, different combinations of P's and Q's, uh, and like compare all of them, and um, we will choose which one is better. So we will do a start with, I don't know, P equals zero, one, 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 uh, sorry, one, zero, one, two, two, one, da, 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 until I believe four, four, okay? Um, that way we can compare a huge range of, of models and like the way to know which one will be more appropriate. Um, we have two criteria for this, Akaiki information criteria and Bayesian information criteria. So these two uh, criteria work, I'm not gonna introduce the formulas, but just gonna mention that they do similar stuff. They both uh, quantify uh, a penalty for the lack of fit and over parameterization. Like the more components, the more uh, AR or MA components that you introduce, like you, you, you guys remember from the basics of linear regression, the more components you add to a linear regression model, the better your fit. But the more, the, the, like this criteria add up, over parameter up uh, over parameterization penalty uh, penalizing excessive uh, components in the models right so because if we can keep increasing uh, lags forever we could have an arma 100 comma 100 and that would be a bunch of uh, terms there it will have a better fit but it's over parameterized so to avoid that this criteria add those penalty checks uh, the difference from that is the way that the penalty is applied. Uh, I believe Bayesian is more strict in terms of overparameterization than Akaiki, but uh, we will use both um, in order to get to a much lo uh, a smaller set of models to, to forecast, right? We don't want to use, I think from one, like from 0, 1 to 4, 4, it's 24, 25 combinations. We don't want that. Right, so we want something in the order of two, three, four, maybe uh, models, and, and compare how the forecasts look like. And please, please, please remember: the lower the number is, the preferred. Okay, so the the combination of P and Q that yields the lower of these uh, criteria will be uh, better than the larger. When these numbers are negative. Always looks for the always look for the larger negative, please. Okay. 
So let's do that. Let's do that in R. Uh, what we're going to do is to create an empty matrix first to put the results in there. So by running this, I see has like it creates a variable uh, uh, matrix, sorry, where we will store all our models uh, with Akaiki and Bayesian uh, data here. Uh, we will start with an empty we will be filling. Let's change the names of these columns. So we will put whatever number of lags of AR in here, whatever numbers of uh, MA in here, and what we will get from AIC and BIC in columns three and four. And we will do that. We will start, I mean, if we're gonna do it in loops, like, like is our plan for today, we'll have to start from like the beginning of the loop will be zero, zero. Uh, an ARMA zero, zero model makes no sense to estimate. An ARMA zero, zero model assumes that this variable is a random walk, which pretty much, pretty much means that it's caused by random. So there is no way to estimate uh, any parameters to, to forecast it. But you know, for the sake of combinations, we will start from zero, zero, zero. So let me do it for the first row. Let me fill up the first row here. And then to fill up the other 24 rows, we will use the loop. So we create an object called fit PQ, in which we're going to estimate an ARIMA model. I mean, an ARMA model, but the command is ARIMA. I will mention what ARIMA means later. ARIMA of dy, and in here we'll specify the lags that we have. An ARIMA model will have a P, D, B, D, and Q here. D here for now, let's leave it at zero. I will explain what that means a bit later. But you know, in here we will put how many autoregressive uh, lags we want. Let's start at zero. And with Q we'll put how many moving average uh, com uh, lags we want. So let's put that at C. Again, a, a, a zero, zero model, an ARMA zero, zero model makes little sense, assumes that the Y is a random walk, but we need to start from there in order to do all the combinations. If we were to do it manually, we will not start there. We will just start from something like this uh, and, and, and then increase the numbers. So I will calculate that in, uh, well, since I'm estimating a model, it's giving me all the terms here for the model. But what I'm interested in is in capturing the AIC term and the BIC term into our matrix. So what I'm doing is filling the first column in the matrix IC with these four terms that I'm concatenating. The first term is a zero, standing from the uh, autoregressive components. The second term is a zero for the moving average components. And in here, um, digging through the parts of this list of results that uh, fit PQ is, we'll grab the IC and capture it. And also BIC. So let me run line 51 and I'll show you. Right, it will go row by row. First term in the row, we'll put a zero. Second term in the row, we'll put a zero. And then we'll put AIC and BIC. And we will do the same uh, for all the other possible combinations but now we're going to do it with loop. And since we have two terms that change, this term and this term, we need to nest one loop in, inside the other. So we'll start with terms from P uh, going from zero to four and terms from Q going from zero to four. And these commands here like are very similar to this one, except for the way that the, that the row index is, is created. Um, this means like every iteration of P will be like, for example, starting with P zero, we'll do zero, 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 one, zero, two, zero, three, zero, four. So that will be five uh, runs of Q while P is in the same index. So that's why we multiply by five. And in order to move to the next one, we add this one, right? Uh, then I don't know, P will move to the next one. So it will be one. So one, zero, one, 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 two, one, three, one, four. That's, those are another five iterations. 
then you will go p equal two, then three, then four. So if like for any reports or something, you have any co confusion on how to like fix this uh, index, please, by all means, uh, let me know and, and I'll give you a hint. For now, let's see and look how nice this is. It will uh, put all the combinations, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, 1, 0, 1, 1, blah, 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 until 4, 4, okay? Um, before I forget, uh, I, I think I already mentioned this, but you know, it's never bad to remember. Uh, for example, an ARMA 01 is equivalent to an MA1, right? Because we don't have any AR components. And uh, a ARMA 10 is equivalent to an AR1. You don't have any moving average components. But in terms of notation, it's always better to use it in ARMA notation, right? putting the zeros if it's just a pure MA or a pure AR. So now our matrix is filled. Uh, what we're going to do is to like filter from lower to higher to see but like this combination, like um, this list is quite massive. Like it's very difficult to know which one is the lowest and if it's the lowest in the others or like doing a lot of models have some advantage because it gives us a lot of options, but like eliminating options is also tricky. So the way that we're going to do this is by selecting the top 10 specifications preferred by AIC and BIC, okay? Um, so AIC, uh, I will filter using a command called order. So I will order terms in EIC, sorry, in IC, uh, from the third column. In our case, it's AIC first. Uh, and I will order in decreasing, uh, increasing, right? So decreasing equals false. So it's increasing from lowest to highest. And I am only keeping the first 10 rows of that data. I don't want the whole. 25. So when I run only line 63, you'll notice that I have created this nice subset where it's showing me the models from lower AIC, like to higher, but from the, like the top 10. So it still are the better models in terms of AIC. And the same for BIC, right? It's going from the lowest to the highest. So what we're going to do, like ordering by IC and BIC, what we're going to do is to compare these two lists. Luckily, we will have some overlaps. Um, um, so, ah, sorry. So we'll notice, for example, that ARMA12, that ARMA12, is the best in terms of AIC, and it's also well ranked in terms of BIC. ARMA 2.1 is well ranked in, in terms of AIC, and it's also in the top 10 in terms of BIC. ARMA 1.1 is well there, and it's like it, do, it does good in AIC and in BIC. Uh, this model, we will not use it, right? Um, and also we have an ARMA 3.0 in both lists. So what we're going to do is try to find um, terms that are in both top tens, and those are the ones that we're going to work with. Uh, if we don't find something like this, if we find like very, like it's very unlikely, but if we can find at least two that are in both lists, then what we can do is to take the best, I don't know, the best, two in one and the best two in the other and move with them. But now we're lucky. We have a subset of four models that are in both top tens. And as you can see, uh, oops, sorry, AIC doesn't change as much. It goes from 217 to 219, 200 to 20 almost. It's not too much of a variation. BIC ranges a bit uh, higher, but uh, like, Ignoring this to, from 232 to 238, still not too wild of a, of a variation. So we can um, 
like they are the decision will be almost indifferent so it's good to use models that are in both all righty so we're going to move forward with uh, let me close these windows we're going to move forward with these two four models arma 11 arma 12 arma 21 and arma 30 uh, so i'm going to add those uh, those four combinations uh, into a, an object called a, a, an object of type list called adq set from adequate set the reason i'm doing this is that later we're going to uh, run a loop so in order for select these models then this then this then this uh, i will go and say okay for terms that are in one until this uh, how many terms adequate set has and please go from the first term in adequate set so it will take this then go for the second it will take this third it will take this and fourth it will take this right it will go and, and select them through, through a loop so i think that's something quite clever that eric has programmed here in order for us to actually be able to do these quick loops like on your own work when you're doing your reports and if you feel like the loops are a bit uh, complicated for you and you decided that for you know time sake or a uh, i don't know a uh, mental health sake you want to go and do manually by all means it, it's fine i just we're just trying to find you a way to to do this uh, and save a chunk of time so i'm adding those to adequate set um, and and now that I've subset for two four models, we will go to the next step in our model selection, which is checking for white noise residual. The second assumption that we made in um, when working with, uh, like last week, right? When we were doing all these uh, calculations. So this is also very important. We should always have white noise residuals. Uh, models that yield residuals that are not white noise are not good. So we should not work with them. And the way to check for white noise residuals is something called a Leon box test. We will also check the plot to see what's up. How does the, long, the Leon box test work? Is doing a uh, joint hypothesis than the first K uh, autocorrelations of this uh, model are equal to zero. So they are jointly insignificant. And if at least one of the, these ones is different than zero, then uh, we will reject the null hypothesis and we will accept the, the alternative, which is that the, we have um, autocorrelations that are like that are correlated, so that's no white noise residual. So this result is quite bad. Okay, so we are doing this hypothesis test. Uh, the good thing with R, I mean, we do have to put a little bit of work, but when we get to the result, the results are gonna be great. So let me do this manually for only one model. So using the check residuals uh, function in the forecast package, um, we can check the residuals of an ARIMA model 101 of dy uh, and check if the residuals are fine. Okay, and of course we are subsetting for 2011. So let me run this. And this is going to show me a plot here, right? And it's going to show me a hypothesis test in here. So the two components of the analysis that I mentioned, we will get here. Don't worry about these two graphs in the bottom, just worry about this. The eye test for the plot is that they should not follow any trends. Uh, it should behave um, quote unquote, stationary um, it should not um, present like any weird stuff even if we have some variation we are we chose to avoid that for the moment so it looks fine in the plot uh, of course the test is more formal it will go until 10 lakhs so that k that i mentioned before in our case is 10 and oh oops, sorry got a little bit ahead and well the we're just going to go and check the p-value. If this p-value is higher than 0 0.05, we will fail to reject, therefore finding no uh, white noise residuals. So for 1.1, one, one, ARMA 1.1, one, one, the model is okay. 
So uh, that one uh, passes the, the white noise check. But let's be smart and let's do this in a loop. So let me wipe my output here to get fresh stuff from the loop. What I'm good going is uh, going from terms from one until whatever number of terms we have here in adequate set, which is one, two, three, and four. So from one to four, check the residuals of the model. And when it comes to specifying the model, take first the first component. So you see how it's going to replace this bit with exactly this, and then it's going to replace it with exactly this. So it's manipulating the, um, the command to take and replace order equal to to the terms of the list that we created before. So running the loop, this is going to take a minute because these calculations are a bit lengthy. So don't worry, please don't like press or um, and like do anything to R until you get the higher than sign here. You notice how I have the blinking bar. It means that it's calculating a so give it a second. If you notice, like, I don't know, it's been half an hour or whatever, and still not giving you results, it will be a stop sign here. Press it, and R will stop wherever it finished. But if you just, for, for more complex stuff, two or three minutes will be more than enough. Just go, you know, stretch your legs and give and let R do its thing. So let's go to check all the plots. Uh, the first model in the list, oops, oh, sorry. Okay, the first model was one, one. We already checked this, the plot is fine and the test is fine. The second model is one, two, that's seen here. A test is fine, plot is fine. A third model is two, one, A test is okay and um a plot is fine and for fourth model uh three zero p value is barely good it's high, still higher than 0 0.05 it's not higher than 0 0.1 so one one might be tempted to be conservative and and uh, discard three zero and go with the first three models but we're gonna be flexible and we can move forward with four but um, like in this point is where you actually trim your selection a little bit. If you notice that a couple of these models are not are not showing good residuals, just drop them and go forward with whatever you have left. So plot is fine and p-value is fine. So yeah, uh, make sure that they are higher than 0 0.05. And please remember the conclusion is that we fail to reject. All right, we don't accept no hypothesis. That's a, 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 an incorrect way of saying stuff. By the way, um, I don't know if we had anyone join later, but I will paste the code uh, for the, the link for code share again, just, you know, if you wanna have access to, to this. Um, oops. Yeah, codes are there. So please um, just copy don't uh, don't uh, cut or edit anything on coaches so your colleagues uh, will find good information all right so that's the last step in model selection we checked that the time series looks stationary that's good we checked that the residuals are fine we uh, we check a uh, information criteria then we check the residuals are fine so whatever set of models that we have up until this point is the ones that we're going to use to forecast. It's good to use uh, at least two or three uh, because then you can uh, like generate your predictions, your forecasts, and compare and see. Okay, my forecasts are not are, are aren't varying too much, so that means that uh, your results are uh, robust. So, uh, what we are going to do is uh, do question H. So let me put the question up here. And now we're going to forecast, right? So let's forecast the changes in the Merck stock prices for January 2012. So now we're going to subset for the um, 
set of observations that I call the uh, test set. And we're going to compare it to, um, to the real price changes, right? Uh, and let's assess um, uh, if the forecasts are consistent across the different specifications that we uh, have selected, meaning that we're going to check for the robustness of our analysis. So um, this process is a little bit uh, long, but I, I added a few comments there just to guide you through the process uh, so you know what's what, right? So the first thing that we're going to do is count or get a number of how many days are in the test sample. So what is our forecast horizon? How many days are we forecasting? So if we sum all the values that are equal to true across the set that we have, the, the sample that we selected, uh, and we subtract all of the truths in, um, in, um, in 2011, we will be left with all the truths in 2012, right? So that's a way to, 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 to count this, um, this forecast horizon. I run it and uh, our forecast horizon, you can see here in the environment is equal to 20. The L means that it's an integer. It doesn't have any um, decimals or whatever. So it means it's 20. 0. 0. 0. 0, right? It's nothing there, it's just an integer number. So it's 20, we're forecasting 20 days in the future. Now we have, a, or yeah, Eric uh, thought it was good to put like, let me show the graph actually. What's the graph? Like in order to actually see how our forecast performs, instead of showing the whole time frame, what we're going to do is to zoom and only see pretty much this in here. I think it will be even less. Yeah, probably all of this only here and see like putting our magnifying glass here and see what's uh, like how the, the values of January that I think would be something like this behave to the values that we're going to forecast. So we do that, um, we put those three reference points. Um, I'm not sure what's the criteria for the first point, uh, but the second and third point is when the horizon is, um, is uh, like it starts and when the horizon will end. So if we run this and you notice that here at X, you'll notice that the first date that we put like this date here will be the day 213th, right? The day where our uh, training sample ends is day 252nd. We already knew that um, because we know that like we had a total of 272 values observed. Uh, and the last 20 are for the test set. So the training set ends here and the, the test set starts after this and ends at the 272nd observation. So yeah, we will set these points, but the, they will be only for um, like to be uh, noted in the axis when we, when we actually select, when we generate the plots of the real values and the uh, forecasted values. I'm going to subset the observations in the test set. So I'm finally going to do the last uh, step in here. Oops, sorry. So I'm finally going to do this. I put the falses in 2011 and the truths in January 2012. Let me go back to the slide where I was. Oh, and actually, I'm way further ahead. Yeah, okay. So I'm subsetting this and leaving actual dy as our criteria to subset for the test set. Uh, and um, I am adding an empty vector to store the forecasts. So I know that I have uh, four models that I deem as adequate. 
So I'm creating an empty vector. Actually, I think I didn't create this. I'm creating an empty vector uh, that instead of being like a regular vector, like four components there, you'll be a list with four slots, okay? That we are going to fill with the loop. And it has whatever number of components adequate set has. So it has four, so it will also be of size four. So when I run here and I show you this F forecast at dy, you notice that I have a list with four slots and everything is empty, right? Fair list of length zero, no, no, no. It's all empty. It's going to receive some information there. I can't do only a vector like without the list thing because when you estimate a model, like an ARMA model, you remember, uh, I think it's in here, you get a lot of information from a single model, right? You get the coefficients, residuals, uh, R, uh, R squared, AC, BAC. So all of those terms will be in each of the slots for the four models that I'm estimating. Alrighty, and then we are going to do this nice uh, loop. So the loop is split in four, in three bits. So what I'm going to do is uh, setting a loop that goes from one until whatever number of models we have. We have four models, right? Uh, it's going to take the, uh, whatever term I have in here as the first. So this C101 will be called model PQ for a, like a, for the intents and purposes of the loop. So I'm taking that information and storing it in a variable here that I'm going to use later, right? So instead of, like I did before was to copy it, like having this in here, but in order to, to avoid having to put all of these with the double square brackets and stuff, I will just add it to an object and put that object like as the loop progresses. So, the first term in like the first empty slot in forecast dy so i would be equal to one so the first term there will be filled with the forecasted information using arima model of dy right for 2011 using the first model which we, you guys remember is 101 and it will put that in there uh, the forecast horizon uh, it's the horizon that we determined before. It's 20 days. If you did it by hand, you can just put it equal to 20. But the good thing about codes like this is that they are replicable. So if you use different data, uh, the code wouldn't change too much. And here we are, we are adding levels for the um, predictive intervals. So what we're using 68% and 95%. So we use 68 and 95% uh, because 68% uh, includes um, like all this area of the normal distribution that is one standard deviation above and below the mean, right? And then we will take everything on the 95% uh, that is two standard deviations above and below the mean okay uh, we will use this in order to produce forecasts and fit them with the like the risk taking profile of the whatever person you are presenting these to so let me just wipe this out and if you add this to um if you add the areas together oops sorry um 34 plus 34 um is equal to 68 and 13.6.34.30 plus 34 plus 13.6 is equal to 98. So 95, sorry. So that's where these two levels come from. Um, afterwards, I am going to create an object called title that is going to have a bunch of test text pasted together. It will start with the test, with the text ARMA and it will open bracket, then it will add whatever number we have in the first term of model PQ. So it will be this number, and then it will paste a, a comma, and I leave a space there, 
then it will paste whatever term is in the third uh, spot here, so this one. And uh, I will close the bracket inside the code marks so it will detect as text, and all of this is separated by nothing, right? So in here, I'm just creating a sign for every run of the loop. In this, for the first run, title PQ will be equal to arma bracket one comma one bracket, and just that in a chunk of text, right? Because I'm going to use that as the title of my plot, okay? So in order to avoid having to put this in here, I just add it to a nice object and that object will be put later. But again, this is entirely optional. You can choose to um, not do it, right? Uh, and then I'm going to generate the plot. So the plot is uh, for the first, like the information that is uh, taking the first slot in forecast D1. Y, so it's the forecast of the model, including horizon times two. So I'm taking like twice the, the horizon of our analysis. The, la the label for Y is well the uh, name of the variable delta Y and the title of the plot is equal to uh, PQ. And I am not putting any labels or any points in the X axis. So that's why this X A X T uh, 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 argument is set to be n, so no, it will not be added. Uh, I am also adding uh, lines for the um, to to compare the actual inf the sorry the forecasted information using two thousand and eleven with the actual information and the axis in the horizontal axis instead of like if you do it the default. R will take whatever range of data and it will um, just um, split there. But since I de uh, determined before that this, uh, like, sorry, where is the graph that I was showing before? Like, remember that I customized, oops, just gonna take a second. These uh, ranges here, I already determined, right? These three points. So I'm telling R to use those three points as the labels in the x-axis. Just like with this bit, what I'm doing is zooming to that last bit of the plot that we are interested in. So again, I'm going to wipe this because I'm going to get a few graphs in here. So please, when you run the loop, uh, don't forget to highlight everything. If you leave anything outside, it's going to be problematic. So just highlight from the four until the closing uh, uh, curly bracket and run. And again, it's gonna take a while. Ah, it's already there. So look, if what R has done is, first thing is all the forecasted models are stored in forecast underscore DY. Like all those three, four models are included in here. So if you expand, you can see like, uh, what method was, what are the coefficients should be there somewhere. Um, no, what are the forecasted values actually? So level here and the upper and lower boundaries according to the levels that we set and the residuals and all of that and that for the four models. So one, 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 two, and so on. So it has, and it has produced the plots that we wanted. So for the one one model, it is showing me like it's zooming in and it's showing me the information from the beginning of November until the end of December of 2011 in the black line. And then it's going to cut and it's going to show me the real values in black. And this uh, blue line is showing me the predicted values. But the dark shade here of blue is showing me the 68% predictive interval and the 95% predictive interval is in the lighter blue area. Uh, these intervals uh, provide me with the upper and lower boundaries, right, of the range which the observed values is expected to be, right? For the blue line, for example, we notice that there is a 68% chance that the change in YT is something in between, I don't know, 0.4, five out there to say, and negative 
4.5. So you can uh, have an indication of if uh, like how high can it go, but also how low can it go. So depending on your risk take profile, if you are like all in, you might be tempted to go with the 95. You can say, okay, I can lose if it, uh, like I can afford to lose if it goes uh, below 0 0.8, something like that, not very good with the scale, but I am also looking for it to go above, uh, or it's likely for it to go above 0. Uh, or increase to 0 0.7 or so, right? So it depends on your risk taking profile. You, if you're more risk uh, taken, you will be going for the large interval. If you're more risk adverse, you say, okay, I will take, um, like, I, I'm not, I'm good with not a such a high increase, but I don't want a huge decrease. So, uh, like, you notice, like, how uh, you will make that decision. Like, what would you use to take to make that decision? So, let me jump to my slides just for a second to compare the four models. Like, I pasted all the um, like all the predictions here for ARMA 1 1. You notice that it seems like at first it kind of follows the trend, like the it's predicting that it will increase and the values will increase, like the difference will increase. Then it predicts that it decreases, it decreases, it predicts that it increases, it increases, but then it, it predicts that it will stop increasing before it actually stopped. So the cycle from that point seems to be broken. Um, at some points it will actually recover. It predicts that it increases and it increases, but I mean, overall, it's not a great prediction. Uh, it's not a great prediction power, uh, but it's it's as good as ARMA will do. Just a bit of a spoiler: ARMA uh, ARMA models are the basic, more basics, most basic of the models. Therefore, they are not usually very very accurate in terms of predictions. Uh, we will learn more accurate models later. But look, compare the one one to the two one two. And you notice that the graphs are very similar. Like it will like go blah, 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 up and down until it eventually just uh, remains. Like the change that it's predicting is quite small. Um, for ARMA 2 1, very similar stuff. It seems at first that it's predicting it uh, quite nicely, but later it will just lose any prediction power. For ARMA 3 0, it, Arma 3 Zero is the most different of the three. Uh, it will stop predicting any changes quite faster than the others. But overall, at, at least three of the four models are consistent. So that's good to, to have. Okay, now for question I, we are asked to forecast the prices of Y levels this time, right? We are not doing any differences uh, because that's where the money is, right? We wanna see changes, but it's easier to explain if you're predicting, I don't know, the prices to go to $28. Uh, it's more visible than to say someone, hey, it's going to increase by zero point something. So we're going to get this in terms of the actual variable and we're gonna predict using ARMA to one model only. So let's, Compare your predict, our predicted prices with the real prices in the data, right? Um, and let's compare uh, to the forecast obtained by transforming the, port, the forecasts in part H, okay? And I will show you what this means. The first bit, what it's telling us is to use Y as our variable of interest. Uh, and use ARMA. And let's use 2 1. I think it's the model that was given to us. Yeah, let's use 2 1 to predict. So we will keep um, the, value, the values of Y for January 2012 in a separate object that we call actual Y, right? And let's forecast Y using ARIMA for that variable y, 
a model to one and the same horizon, the same levels uh, that we had previously, um, that, we has, that we had previously uh, uh, determined. And let's generate the plot. So I'm going to write this. So the plot will be the first thing there. And generate the, the plot, like the code is pretty much the same. What I'm changing is that the object in here, uh, instead of having to call from a, a component of a list, we already have the, the object in here. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, we're using the, the same axis and, and Y and X and everything. And now I'm putting a limit here in the vertical axis. I'll show you what that means. So let's generate the plot. We notice that the story here is now different. The uh, predictive intervals are no longer a band. They now look like um, like a uh, I don't know a curve, like it's expanding, meaning that this model is predicting like less, uh, like the changes are more. No, sorry, the predictions are more closer together. So uh, the prediction is more reliable the closest it is to the uh, start of the prediction. And it becomes less and less as the future moves ahead because you know the further your horizon, the less likely you are to be wrong in terms of your forecasts. But here you can see something quite interesting. It is forecasting that the variable is a uh, decreasing, right? Um, which is way different to the value to the values that we observed. So we can conclude two things. First, we can see visually how bad it is to use a ARMA on a variable that is not stationary, right? Pretty much it has no predictive power at all. Our mind is predicting anything that it's completely different to what we can actually observe in the real data. So that, yeah, further confirmation, our models are not appropriate to use on variables that are not a, that are not a, a stationary, such as Y, okay? What we're going to do now, in order to actually get the predictions in terms of YT, is to um, rely on the same process that we did before. So use delta y, but um, like include the first point. Let me open up the data. Let me try to find it. So that would be 2011, 0, 01. Uh, oh, sorry, 2010, December. So what I'm going to do is to grabbing the last point right before our training set started because I'm predicting changes, right? So if I say that my starting point is 27.45 and then I'm predicting that it changes by, I don't know, increases by 0 0.3, that means that Y will change to 27.07. And so incorporating this last point will help us to rescale that. Like in order to use Delta Y, use ARMA on Delta Y, um, but not instead of like, yeah, instead of having Y, like getting the, sorry, the predictions in terms of Y in, in um, without using ARMA on Y. I hope that's clear. Sorry, I, I made a mess there. I, I'm just trying to say that I'm not using ARMA on uh, a non-stationary model. I'm using it on a stationary model, but I want to get my predictions in terms of the value of a, a variable in levels, not how it changes. So I'm going to change that value. I'm going to, sorry, capture this variable, this value that I was mentioning before. So I am uh, capturing in here. I think I need to delete this. Let me see. Why? Is... Uh, sorry, Will. I think, I think yeah. you delete. So now you're capturing the 1st of January. I think that minus one was trying to capture the 31st of December. No, look, it's lower than. So ah, it's you're right. right before. If it was equal, lower or equal, I will have to take one. Good catch, though. That's that's good. But All yeah, right, thank yeah. you. Look, I got twenty-seven point four five five, which is the number that I was looking at. That 
the observation for December 31st, 2010. So I got that point. I'm going to add it to the Ys that I have in my training set. So that's going to be my new first point here on Y X. So uh, instead of having 252 values in my training set, now I have 253 starting with, oh, it's it duplicated. So it should have a problem here. I no, yeah, I think I was supposed to capture because it's already capturing it. So I think when I subset, I might have left, uh, hang on, bear with me for a moment, please. Ah, yeah, I'm capturing, uh, oh no, wait, 2011. I don't, know, I don't know why it's capturing that first. Uh, I was already capturing that first uh, point in here. So it seems that the subsetting was a bit defective. Sorry about that, but it's just a, a point. As long as we have our starting value uh, fine, like our, our, our predictions will not lose, like not too much uh, uh, consistency. So. Sorry about this, I will double check. But um, yeah, it, will, it, it should not be a problem anyway. So yeah, I'm adding that there. I now have a, a slightly larger training set. I'm going to do the same thing. Um, uh, like, you know, adding a forecast, creating a forecast vector, a list um, uh, with four components or so four uh, terms that I have inadequate set. Same thing as I did before. And I'm going to forecast all over again, but now I'm going to use Arima. So let me show you what I mean by Arima. Yeah, okay, this, this is what I mentioned before. Now let's use an Arima model, autoregressive integrated moving average. It's a slight extension of the Arma model, but now this term in the middle allows us to also include how many differences I want to take from the data. So I'm working with the data in levels, but the model is doing the first differencing for me, right? So like do a one, one, two model will take, will leave only one a term here. So P1 will be here and everything else will be deleted. Uh, it will take one first difference. So it will only be one in here and it will leave two terms in the error term. So everything extra here will be left out. It's useful because we can now generate predictions of the variable in levels and doing the first differencing uh, to, um, to like bring the stationality that we need. So the ARIMA model is uh, adequate, okay? So I hope, I hope that, that that bit is, it's okay. So what I'm doing now here is taking this adequate set, uh, what is it, in here, and changing these middle terms, these second terms, with ones. Because now, since I'm using arima of y, I need to control for that. I need to take that into consideration. So, oops, sorry, I jumped the gun. Uh, oh, no. Well, where, where, where was I? Here. Yeah. What I'm doing is that all the, all the middle terms in the adequate set, I will replace them with a one. Um, and this is the model that I'm going to use. Uh, I'm using Y, like the new training set as my variable. And I'm using the ARIMA models with the ones in the middle, right? I already... Um, uh, updated the model, the specifications to include that one. Everything else is the same, the same horizon, the same levels uh, in here. Uh, Eric also added the option include constant equal true. That's the default setting. It's default set to true, so it's it's okay. It doesn't need to be here, but it's fine. 
And then the title thing, the same stuff. I'm just creating that chunk of text that will be put here in the title. Uh, and I'm generating the plots. So let me wipe this because I'm generating four new plots. And let's see how the forecasts were done. So I now have my models. Um, oh yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention. Um, like you probably noticed by now, an Arma, an Arima 310, for example, of YT is equivalent to an Arma 30 of Delta YT. But it's better to use this notation because in here we are specifying how many differences. It's very rare that we will use the second difference in here. Uh, but if the time ever comes, I will let you know. Okay. Um, it's usually one. But they are equivalent. That's what I wanted to mention. Sorry, let me wipe um, my annotations here. And let's see our predictions. Now, since we're working with Y, now you notice that um, we still have that behavior regarding the predictive intervals. Uh, they are more like close together, closer to the, to the start of a forecast. They are like more difficult to forecast by the end of it. But if you also notice the prediction, uh, like it's not quite good, but it at least, sorry, at least it follows the trend, the, the, yeah, the evolution of YT at that point. It's not predicting that it will decrease. It's predicting that it, it increases slightly um, where we observe that it's actually the case. For 1.1, one, one, that's the case. For 1.2, similar stuff, it will, it is predicting that it increasing and the, the variable actually kind of had that um, uh, upward trend there. Uh, same in here and same in here. So, uh, and you notice, for example, how the 68 interval is, is quite accurate. It only is a bit off at the beginning, but afterwards we can count, uh, like if you are a risk, uh, at risk adverse person, you can say, okay, this is good. I will not be taking too much risk and the rewards will be fine. And you notice that it is uh, like it's capturing that behavior quite uh, efficiently. So that's good. Okay. All right. So that's the end of question, like part one until A. So that's how we will create these forecasts. Um, let me see if I have any more commentary to make. Now the, the, the idea now would do or to repeat the process um, um, for uh, log returns. Oh, wait, another conclusion, let me, I remember. And another thing that we were asked to conclude is on the robustness on the, on the results. And you notice that the results are quite similar regardless of the model that we use. Like, like these areas are pretty much the same uh, regardless of the model. So we can conclude that our specifications are robust, like our predictions, sorry, are robust to specification. It doesn't matter what model are we using, the predictions are very similar. So we can rely on any of them and we can use that for a decision making. Um, okay. Let me see. I don't think I have any more. Um, okay, and these predictions for Arima are um, like predicting using Arima for YT. It's better than to predict um, YT using Arma, right? This prediction is quite bad. It's better to use um, this one. Now, let's repeat the process. What we're going to do now is to do everything over again, uh, but for log returns, okay? Uh, so let's like check the stationarity. I'm going to like do this quite fast. I want this to be recorded. Uh, if you were in, a, in, in, in an in-person tutorial, I will ask you guys to do this yourself. If you want to do it, by all means, go for it. 
I will not share the code on how to do this bit today. It will be in the log file that I'm going to share by the weekend. So if you want to there in, in this last 20 minutes or so and, and try it, and, and if you have any problems, uh, let me know. The commands for the forecasting and everything are very, very similar. So it will be just a matter of uh, like copying, paste, and, and doing a little twitch there to make it work. So what we're going to do now is like the same procedure, right? First, we're going to check the time series. Uh, we notice that log returns also uh, seems to have a constant mean over time. The mean doesn't seem to change. It doesn't have follow any trends or anything like that. So yeah, it, log returns is also good to work with. Uh, let's check ACF and BACF. Uh, ACF, like uh, regardless of this first, we always uh, avoid this first uh, line. Row one, two, three, da, 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 all of that are pretty much not different than zero. We don't see any structure. So that's not a bad sign, but it also doesn't give us an indicator of what kind of model we, we should use. PACF, the same, doesn't have any structure. So we will choose to use ARMA uh, and, you know, combinations up to four, four. So what we're going to do is exactly that, like create the empty matrix for the information criteria, change the names of it. Uh, so we will have all of this. Wait, hang on. I didn't run this. Uh, I'm going, we're going to fill this with combinations from 0, 0 to 4, 4 and compare using NC and BIC. So it's the same loop um, that we had before. Uh, the only thing that you need to change is R, right? Because it's the variable that it's been estimated there. And remember the zero, because we don't take any differences of this log value, a variable here with the arima operator. Uh, a bit of a hint, if you were to do it up to five, the only change that you need to do is change this to a six, okay? So that's, um, that's all you need to do for all of these rows to be filled with your models. So let's run the loop. And it's still calculating. And yeah, we have our AC and BIC. Note please how the AICs and BICs are now negatives. So we would like to find the higher negative. Like it's always, always the lower number. Uh, so let's and create both tables in here with the, with the best 10 models in terms of AIC and BIC. So it's the same procedure. Uh, and we notice something quite interesting, the same specifications that, are, um, that apply for Delta YT are the same that apply for RT. So it's, uh, it's quite interesting. So we have one, two, Two, one, 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 and three, zero. Uh, I was expecting different specifications, but I didn't get that. Um, so yeah. And please note how is uh, putting first the higher negative number. So negative fifteen hundred and fifty-two is higher than is lower than negative five uh, five thousand five one thousand five hundred and forty-nine, right? And same in here. Oh, whoops, sorry. Same in here, not this. It seems that it's a larger number, but it's negative, so the logic is inverted. Next step, uh, we have now uh, added an adequate subset of the models, right? It's the same things I pretty much copy and paste that adequate set uh, a model that uh, element that list that we had before, because now it's time to check the residuals. Okay, so let's um, use the same procedure, but it, it, like the same code, but instead of delta yt, I'm using r. And let's see what the residuals have to show for these four specifications. Uh, the residuals for one one seem to be fine, for one two as well. They don't seem to go any crazy in terms of trends. Same for two one, and they. We are going to pretty much go up and down there. It's so good for three zero as well. And when checking there, I actually have to summarize 
version in here. We notice that we will fail to reject at all tests, including this one as well. It's a bit low, but still. So all of these residuals are white noise. And finally, we come to the part where we uh, do the, the, oops, the predictions. So again, the commands, the, the codes are the same. Um, right i'm creating the horizon I'm, I'm determining the horizon is going to be 20 same thing the points like for the zoom in are going to be the same uh, the values in the test set will be subset with this uh, and i'm creating the empty vector to store all the four models estimated um, right the, the models are taken from this adequate set so that's in that goes in here. That will be replaced here and here, um, using the same um, uh, the same uh, um, the confidence uh, you know, prediction interval. Sorry, the same levels for the prediction intervals. The same horizon. Just pretty much the same code, just changing R. Uh, I'm doing the title, but you know this is optional, and I'm creating the plots. So let's run all of these oh sorry all of this actually and let's check the predictions oh no so prediction for three zero um like happened the same as delta y it started quite like kind of following the same like it predicts that it goes up it went up it predicts that it goes down it went down but afterwards, it will just not have any prediction power. So it's the same that we observed before uh, for the 3 0. Uh, for 1 1, actually, let me show you the slide where I'm summarizing it. Um, for 1 1, like it, it, it shows this zigzag and it will, like, right by the end of the horizon, it will not no longer predict any change. But at the beginning, it does. Similar stuff here to one, two, similar stuff here to two, one. So our models are predicting, like our predictions are, um, uh, seem to be um, robust to specifications. Uh, Arma 30 seems to be the model that is uh, giving more uh, problems there. But uh, other than that, our predictions, uh, like it seems to be strong, doesn't seem to be quite good, to be honest. Uh, again, ARMA models, ARIMA models are very, uh, very, uh, th these are preliminary models. We will build upon them to more complex models that hopefully will give us better predictions. Okay, um, that, that will be all that we will discuss for today. Thank you uh, so much for your attendance. Thank you so much for your participation. Uh, I will uh, stop sharing, uh, stop recording now and upload the recording to, to, uh, to Blackboard during the weekend. Thank you.